Coming up next on this Arizona Horizon Veterans Day special, we'll hear from national leaders in the nation's ROTC programs. Also tonight, we'll see how a special court is helping veterans, and we'll learn about a near full-size replica of the Vietnam Wall being built in Gilbert. Those stories next on this special edition of Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this Arizona Horizon Veterans Day special. I'm Ted Simons. We begin with a look at ROTC programs that help promote future military leaders from our high school and college campuses. Earlier this week, the top leaders of the Air Force, Army, and Navy Marines ROTC units visited ASU to meet with school administrators along with ROTC commanders, cadets, and midshipmen. There was also a panel discussion on how the military develops leaders. Here to talk about all that and more, Army Colonel Robert Bennett, the Army ROTC Deputy Commanding Officer, Navy Captain Robert Fink, the Naval ROTC Deputy Commander, and Air Force ROTC Commander Colonel Sherry Stearns Bowles. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's define some terms here. What is ROTC? For the Army Reserve Officer Training Corps, and that is where we have students who wish and a desire to become a commissioned officer in the United States Army. And oh, by the way, we spent, like we just celebrated our 100 years of ROTC, United States Army. So we off offer a curriculum uh, from freshman to senior year. It's military science. And it's a leadership development program arranging from everything from drill and ceremony all the way to small unit patrolling tactics to leadership, types of leadership, being critical thinkers, adaptive, being agile, flexible, and being able to operate in a complex world and environment today. Now, that's Army ROTC. Navy ROTC, does it differ? Is it the same kind of thing? It's the same type of thing, but we have different applications. We're gonna be preparing individuals for at sea service if you're going to be Navy, Marine Corps would be a little more uh, analogous to the Army as we would have ground operations. But we have the same uh, four-year program where we are developing individuals to earn commissions uh, into either the Navy or Marine Corps. We teach them military science along the way, give them leadership opportunities uh, throughout their, their student organizations. But we have the same basic general uh, concept as the other services. And how about the Air Force? We have the basic premises as the other two services. However, the folks that we commission through our program are a little bit different than the other services. We commission uh, mostly what we call line active duty officers. So those would be folks that are going on active duty as opposed to either reserve or guard commissions. Uh, and what we mean by line officers are the pilots, uh, space operators, missile operators, uh, finance folks, personnelists, etc. Our uh, medical corps is done by officer training school, which is not under our command. So that's kind of the difference between us and maybe some of the other services. Is, is it similar, does it work out to maybe a military commitment in exchange for a paid college career? Is that in general, is that how it works? It is, and there are different uh, uh, points at which a student can come into the program, and I believe the other services are the, are the same. So our basic premise is what we call a high school scholarship program student, which means they come in with certain standards and they're given a full ride four year scholarship to attend any uh, college or university where we have a host attachment or a crosstown arrangement. They can also enter uh, after a freshman year, um, either at the three-year point that, or the two-year point, and we have just recently um, resurrected what we call our one-year program. Uh, and those are folks that we come that come into the program. They consolidate four years worth of academics and training and field training, all of that into one year when we're trying to grow the force, which is where we're at right now. Yeah, you had mentioned academic programs mm -hmm. and things that are are learned. Are, are, does this also mix in with uh, English and social science studies and all the things that non ROTC college students would learn? How, how do you balance those classes? Well, that, that's what's difficult, Ted, today, and 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 trying to get a degree and on average. A degree is about 4.5 years. That's how long it takes, uh, and it, and that is what's challenging because in in, mil, in military science, one, two, three, and four, you do physical training three days a week in the morning. Then you'll have a uh, one class that'll occur usually in our case on a Wednesday, and then you have a lab, uh, one lab. So the touch points that uh, our professors of military science have with these cadets is between uh, 3.5 and 4 days a week. So we know those cadets very well and the preparation gearing them to be a second lieutenant in the United States Army. I'll bet you do. As far as the character building skills and, and talking about paths to leadership, 
How exactly does that work? What do you want to see from someone who just starts fresh and see again from that same person once they're ready to go? Well, Ted, we'd like to see that they, they develop along the way. And we give most uh, students get several opportunities. You know, once every year, they'll move on. And they might be a squad leader one year. They'll move up to a higher position of leadership every year throughout. And we want to see that growth. Uh, of course, we have staff members that are, are there to guide them and to be mentors along the way. But what, to answer your question, we're looking for that, that growth at each new uh, increasing scope and responsibility. Do we see the increase in performance? I would imagine self-discipline, leadership, all of those things. Are, are they quantifiable or do you just you kind of know it when you're seeing it? It, the, the, it's very difficult to quantify, and you're right. We do. You, see, you know when you see it in the individual that they've kind of gotten to that point. Uh, some take longer than others, and, and some will need more intervention from other staff and other students as well. That'll help them along their way. Talk talk about leadership development training as far as the Air Force ROTC is concerned. Some of the things that that uh, the commander mentioned are, are things that we also do. But one of the things that that hasn't been hit upon that's really important, and I would imagine the other services do it as well, is what we call peer leadership mm. development. Mm. So we both have, we all have programs where we have what we call a junior class, which would be the freshmen and the sophomores, and then they go through a field training experience, which is a Title X requirement for all of us, uh, and they transition into what we call a senior class, which is generally the juniors and the, the seniors. And so what we like to see is when they are first entering the program, they're kind of in, in a followership role, and they're, they're not only being mentored and led um, by our cadre, but also by those junior and senior cadets that can do some training uh, and some mentoring and some shaping and some molding. So that's a really big aspect of our training programs that, that often doesn't is not known, but we need it, need to emphasize. Yeah, I bet you it's a pretty big factor too. It when is. You get down to it. it is. As far as requirements for people that are interested, uh, young people that are listening now or watching and saying, I'm not sure about this, I might be interested. What do they have to have in order to get into the ROTC? Well, uh, yeah, there are, there are, of course, physical standards have, have a play. What you make on your uh, GPA at high school, you're looking at uh, your SAT or ACT based upon where you're at geograph geographically and what tests you take. Um, and then uh, just coming in, at least for the Army, and, and talking to us and, and just getting a feel for uh, the type of person you are. We are looking at a person who volunteers, who's involved in their community, who plays sports, just kind of an all-around leader. Are those people getting easier or more difficult to find? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it is easy, it is hard, but I, I will tell you, you know, we offer $274 million in scholarships, and uh, that, is, that is very, very, uh, you know, appeasable to those students who want to become ROTC cadets, and they're very interested. So I, I would say that, uh, yes, we are looking and needing them, but uh, they come and find us as well. If I could uh, add one thing to that, uh, we have also, besides the people that are on scholarship, we have people that come in and just volunteer to be part of the program. So any college student, a freshman or sophomore, can come and join the unit. They wear the uniform like everyone else does, but they're not on scholarship, but they have all the same requirements um, as, as a person on scholarship would. However, they have the opportunity at the end of the first year to compete for a three-year scholarship or for a two-year scholarship later on. So there's opportunity even if they don't uh, apply for the scholarship, which is available on, on the websites. We all have our own websites. You can Google you know, ROTC scholarships and you can find any service and apply. But those who aren't selected still have the opportunity to participate, check it out, see if they like it, and then try to compete for a, a shorter scholarship down the road. And quickly, same question to you. Are, are, are young people, is it more difficult to find in this day and age, or are, are you uh, got to keep them away? I, I'm, I'm not seeing the same thing. We're seeing a very, very high caliber of individual. Uh, we will have over 5,000 people apply when we'll award about 1,400 scholarships, and the people that we're leaving behind are very, very high quality. So I'm saying that it's, it's relatively easy for us. If you're, if you're seeing the same thing, has it always been this way, whether it's more difficult or easier? Or whatever the case may be? I don't know that, that, um, that I can answer that question easily. I know that right now in this environment that we're in, uh, certainly the scholarship money is a draw, but at, in our Air Force ROTC, we try to have at, at least 75% of folks that are on scholarship, but that leaves that other 25% who's not on scholarship. And really what, when you ask what is it we're looking for, we want somebody who wants to serve. Yes. And yes. so the quality is there. Mm -hmm. I think we all are seeing the quality. There's no shortness on quality. But we want people that want to serve, and there's no shortage right, right. of those folks either, which we're glad to see because that's what we need in the military is folks who want to serve. Indeed, and that's why I was kind of wondering if you're seeing more of those folks or fewer of those folks. And we, we, we are seeing... We have no shortage. Yes. I don't th know that we ever were at a point where we didn't see them, though. Maybe, um, you know, before my time, 
because um, I'm an ROTC product myself, and, and there were lots of folks that, that, were, that were willing to come in at that time as well. Um, so I think we'll probably see more rather than less right now, just because of the environment that we're in. Last question. I want to go around real quickly here as far as the role of the ROTC in our nation's defense. Talk to us about that, briefly, if you could. Our nation's defense, it's very key. I mean, we produce 5,000 second lieutenants a year. That's more than what West Point produces. So we uh, produce, that's 70% of second lieutenants in the United States Army. That's key. That fill a total of 20 branches in the United States Army. And they'll attend school, and then afterwards they're out in our military formations. Uh, and whether they're, and they're immediately, based on what's going on in the op-tempo of the world, they're out in, in some of these bad places doing great things. They're trained. We're building our future leaders in the United States Army, and I'm very proud. What are you seeing as far as the role? We, uh, well, as far as our numbers go, we're, we're about the same as our Naval Academy are, about 30% for each of us, with the other 40% coming from uh, Officer Candidate School. But they're filling the same role. They're going to be uh, officers in the Navy. And one thing that's interesting, at least in our service, is that the uh, people in the ROTC tend to stay in past their initial commitment. They owe five years for their four-year scholarship, and we're seeing a, an increasing number of them staying to longer service in the Navy. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Our role is absolutely critical on the Air Force side in terms of providing to uh, the nation's defense. We, as I mentioned earlier, are the primary um, um, producer of, of line active office, active duty officers in the Air Force. We also now are on tap to provide folks that will commission into the Reserve and Guard. And it's all about what we call the total force structure. So we That's absolutely right. are critical to the nation's defense. All right. Well, very good information. Again, Google ROTC and you'll get to uh, wherever you need to go, I would imagine, for all three branches. Good to have you all here. Thank you Thank so much. You. For Thank you for Thanks having us. Much. Next, we look at a court that focuses on veterans. The Maricopa County Superior Court System includes over a dozen specialty courts that serve specific populations like the homeless or address specific crimes like DUIs. Every court is different and has its own set of rules and procedures. Producer Elisa Adams and photographer Rob McJanet take a look at one specialty court that focuses on veterans. So we're going to go ahead and walk around the bridge here and, and take that path. On a hot Phoenix morning, Ray Perez and his partner from the Veterans Community Resource and Referral Center are looking for their comrades. Do you know of any veterans that might be in the area? They know in the urban corners they'll find veterans who need a hand. My name's Ray. All right, brother. Thank you for your service. And they'll help them up. I'm going to get you a water. I think anyone that's served their country, they, they've got the potential of becoming a good person or being a good person. You know, some of us, unfortunately, we make wrong choices in our life and we, we go down some dark roads and some of us do get lost and don't find our way back home. Ray has been down that dark road. After his time as an infantry soldier, he found life outside the confines of the military wasn't easy. I started drinking very heavily as soon as I got out, almost immediately, but I was still very functional. But because of my drinking, uh, there was a lot of, I was definitely on a path of self-destruction. Eventually, the alcohol consumed my entire life. I went through a divorce, lost my children, lost my home to foreclosure, and I just quit going to work. That was it. I gave up on life pretty much. Sir, what's the last four of your social? Ray was homeless, in and out of jail, and then he landed here. This is Veterans Court. In this court, there are strict rules. You have repeatedly violated the court's orders. Respect is equally required and given. It's very courageous to ask for help when you need it. And sometimes and there are second and even third and chances. I know there's been a struggle this month, so I want to talk to you um, about how you think things have been going and how we can help you. And the thing I like about it that I think works really well is that team approach and everybody's in there and the common goal 
is to to get these vets their resources back on their feet. Um, you know, they've had a period of stability and responsibility when they were in the service, and it's still there. It's just a matter of, of getting that back. Tiffany Grissom says the idea of this specialty court began in 2010, when they started seeing more and more vets enter the criminal justice system with a unique set of problems. One of the biggest challenges we have are these veterans, whether they're combat veterans or not, um, they're, they're used to structure, they're used to order. Um, and so it's sometimes we run into, you know, problems trying to get them on board just to buy in to get the treatment that they need. Drug and alcohol abuse are also almost universal with the veterans in this court. There is absolutely no medical condition that you have that is going to be helped by methamphetamine. In my career, this is the population that alcohol has been the biggest uh, problem. And, you know, the drugs and alcohol, a lot of it is, is they're self-medicating. You know, there's mental health issues, there's PTSD, um, anxiety and depression, and, you know, now they're in the legal system. And um, so, of course, they're, they're self-medicating because they're not getting the proper treatment that they need or they haven't quite, quite bought into that yet. Here, they buy in or they go to jail. Commissioner Wendy Morton, while sympathetic, I appreciate the challenges. Doesn't tolerate excuses. You're going to have to find the money to test. Vets who get into the program make a deal. They get a suspended sentence, essentially serving probation instead of jail time. But they have to answer to the team on a regular basis. It's not a free ride in veterans court at all. Um, sometimes the vets come in and think, oh, they're going to take good care of me and not hold me accountable. But they're certainly held accountable. Um, you know, and there are requirements because the ultimate consequence is prison and, and we, we want, really want to avoid um, that at all costs. The weekly court hearings include case managers from the VA, probation officers, lawyers for the vets. What's missing are prosecutors because on this team, there are no adversaries. It's been a challenge, but it's, it's been an amazing journey. Vets are identified and chosen for the court based on a number of criteria their service, their sentence, and their potential for success. The team actually chooses some of the toughest cases. Number five. Ray was one of those. He was the vet that I talked about that we couldn't get him to buy in. Um, he he kind of was he, saying the right things. I thought vet court was something pretty cool, pretty easy. You know, they thanked me for my service for um, doing good things or giving me gift cards. I was like, oh, this is a walk in the park here for me. Then he landed back in jail, and he knew he probably wouldn't get any more chances. Vet court ordered me to mental health treatment. Diagnosed with PTSD, Ray finally learned the tools to walk his way back. After losing everything, and this was finally where I threw in the towel for the first time, I wanted to start changing because I, I wanted to. I was tired of the revolving door, I was tired of the chaos. You know, I was at that point where, hey, you know what, I'm going to really give this a shot because I wanted to. You'll still find Ray in Veterans Court every month, but he's got another role on the team. Now he's a peer support specialist. Thank you for your service, man. Helping other vets buy into the idea of helping themselves. Is there anything you need us to help you carry? Because whether he's in court or on the streets. I'm glad you're coming with us, man. Ray lives by the warrior ethos. Never leave a man behind. Let's head on back. The success rate for probationers in the Veterans Court is about 83 percent compared to 70 percent for those serving standard probation. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. Close our Veterans Day special with a look at a new park being built in Gilbert, a park dedicated to veterans from across generations. Producer Elisa Adams talked to those helping to make Welcome Home Veterans Park a reality. With a military introduction in a dusty lot in Gilbert, hundreds of military veterans and their families dedicate a park with a simple message. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome Home Park is a seven-acre shout-out to veterans who never got the word 40 years ago. I was actually deployed over to Vietnam in uh, April 1968. Skip Erickson was a crew chief in the Air Force. His job, to make sure the fighter jets were ready for their daily missions. Ours was more like normal, I think, service. 
hours of boredom filled by moments of terror. Uh, they lob in some rockets, mortars. They try to invade the base a couple times, the enemy. At night, mostly it was, uh, there was shelling. A lot of it was at night. And uh, the hills right behind the harbor, they would illuminate the harbor probably every half hour. John Chiazza served in the Navy during the Vietnam War. He remembers when he first arrived in the Southeast Asian country after 21 days at sea. You start seeing the jets flying by and helicopters all over, and then you realize it's great seeing land, but this land I'm going into is torn apart by war, and this is for real. By the time I got to Nam, I was a uh, captain uh, with the military, military intelligence uh, uh, division. Roger Pollard was drafted into the Army when he was 20 years old. We were at the cross of two canals. There were no roads. Uh, the only way in and out of there was by boat, which was about an hour and a half to province, or by chopper, which was a lot faster and more desirable because bad things happen on the canal. The three men served in different branches of the military, different areas of Vietnam. Their jobs and experiences with battle were all different in a war that was as muddy as the waters they encountered. But they all came home to feel the same sting. It was lousy. Uh, it was uh, not a lot of fun to come home to. I was welcomed home by my mom, my dad, and my brothers, and that's pretty much it. And I certainly wasn't unique. Nobody really uh, came up and said, uh, in fact, nobody came up and said, shook my hand and said, thanks and welcome home. The United States was a country divided, and the soldiers got blamed for a battle they didn't begin. That's what brings them all here, to this barren lot that holds the promise of redemption. This isn't a bunch of old guys trying to build themselves a monument. I wouldn't be involved if it was just a wall. The whole concept of the park is it's welcome home veterans park. A veterans park, not necessarily just a Vietnam veterans park. The park will include recognition of soldiers who fought in America's very first wars. There will be an education center and a veterans outreach center. The anchor will be a replica of the Vietnam Wall Memorial. Anybody our generation, you're going to know 10, 20, 30 folks on that wall, even if you weren't in the service. Classmates, neighbors, uh, relatives. All three men have been to the wall in Washington. And standing before the thousands of etched names, they say they all felt the weight of their time in Vietnam. It was tough. Um, because it just gave a whole look at something that happened in my life that, you know, I was, I was a part of. And here, I was lucky to come back, but there was guys on that wall that that didn't. I realized that I saw people about the son of my age, my, my, the age of my son's, uh, Zachary's, there, and they were touching the wall and touching the name. And then I thought, oh my gosh, you know, their father's on the wall. And that was tough because I thought I, I was lucky, you know, very lucky to have a, a son and have a grandchild now. And, and, uh, and I must admit that survivors go, boy, that's tough. That works on you. But these survivors are proud to bring the power of that wall to Arizona. Other veterans that are Vietnam veterans that are, you know, I have a few over in California, they probably can't make it back to D.C., you know, either by affordability or age and, you know, and not being able to, to actually make it, that they'll have something to actually go to. To make sure that each generation learns from its past. And I'm proud of everybody here today, just the way we do welcome them home, say thanks. Uh, it's the right thing to do. And to help welcome their fellow veterans home. We're still healing after all these years. It's, it, Vietnam vets are still healing, but they're healing. But they also want others to realize that we can never do that again. We can never treat veterans like that again. The Vietnam Wall in Gilbert will be an 80% scale replica of the memorial in Washington. Welcome Home Veterans Park hopes to be open to visitors by Veterans Day 2017. Monday on Arizona Horizon, Maricopa County Sheriff-elect Paul Penzone will join us in studio to talk about his role as the new sheriff in town. And we'll hear about millions in EPA funds being given to Arizona tribes to help with environmental issues. 
That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us on this special Veterans Day edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.